Crime One and Chaos contains adult language and graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Top of the morning to you, Chaos Kids. I'm Amber. And I'm Naomi. And this is Crime, Wine, and Chaos. Look at you. <laughs> Look at you inspired. <laughs> Look at me. Look at me go. Hey, sister. Hey, hi. Remember hi. when you used to like just do it like a journalist? <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> Good morning, chaos kids. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh my God. I know. I feel like I am going to run out of ideas though. You're good at that's that. why I literally I get ideas and I write them on a sticky note and I stick them on the desk here so that like I have like some to choose from. Ah, I need to mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. That's what showers that. are for. Those shower thoughts. You know what I mean? I know. You know, I have a bad habit of forgetting what the thought was by the time I'm dried off. I'm like, oh, <laughs> it was. I think it was good. I felt like it was. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it was great. I'm sure it was fucking brilliant. Oh God. What's oh, hi, new? sister. Hi. Oh, what's new? Uh, well, weird work week or work, just weird week, right? Like, uh, Monday, uh, I took the day off Tuesday. We had the day off obviously for the 4th of July. And so Monday, oh man, Monday was brilliant. Monday was, was, I was at the, I was at the naked lady spa for six hours. Oh, it was glorious. I was scrubbed and moisturized and I soaked and sauntered and soaked and sauntered and soaked and sauntered some more. And I oh. almost fell asleep a couple times while I was there. Oh. It was amazing. And then I worked a weird three day work week. And right before we started recording today, I went and had my monthly massage. So, you know, self care. Self care was oh. the theme of the week which Mm -hmm. I really, really needed because last week I basically had a meltdown in my CEO's office and said, I think, I think I'm burning out. So I, (laughs) I needed to take care of myself and that's, that's what I've been doing. How about you? What's going on with you? I need to take a, a page out of your book. Um, nothing, well, nothing like that. No, uh, yeah, uh, yesterday, Michael and I, I saw my first concert ever at the zoo. First off. At the zoo? At the Woodland Park Zoo. Yes, they do concerts in the meadow. Incredible. Weird. (laughs) So weird. (laughs) It was so awesome. We went and saw Nickel Creek. I don't know what that is. Oh, um, they're incredible. They're like a folk, uh, they're a trio. It's just, they're just fucking incredible. You should look it up after this insane. Okay. They're good on their instruments. It was fantastic. Well, I love that. I'm glad Thanks. you guys did that and had a good time. Yeah. Did have a good time. It was hot AF, but mm-hmm. it's been very hot. Mm-hmm. It's been very hot. What are you drinking? Oh, that's that was a good segue because I actually pulled out a chilled white. I am drinking Los Andes Chardonnay from Argentina. Well, I have to put my pinky up for that. That sounds Ooh. fancy. Well, it's pretty tasty. Also, I was just making um, a white sauce for dinner, and so I needed some wine. So, of course, you were because you're fancy. <laughs> I'm not fancy. White sauce is for fancy people. Okay. <laughs> oh my god, sister! Nothing fancy here. Oh uh, well. Um, <clears throat> how about we just get right into it then? Yeah, you got some crime yeah. over there. Okay, I do. I do. And you, you, you might be familiar with this one. Uh, it's, it's kind of notorious. Uh, it's one that I think for a lot of us, once we hear it, it kind of sticks with us. Uh, but this one just really, I, I wanted to, I wanted to dig in deeper on it. And also, uh, when I went looking, it turns out that this crime was the very first episode ever of forensic files. No way. Wow. So yeah, back in 1990. Six, I believe. Uh, so uh, this is going to get real. We're going to, because I watched it. So, <laughs> so and I read some things. So we're going to get real science-y. Uh, okay. We're gonna get into some forensics. We're going to get deep into some forensics here. And then once, once you, once you, uh, we get into it, you'll, if you haven't heard it, especially you'll understand why the forensics are so important on this case. So okay. I'm going to tell you about the murder of Hella Crafts. Okay. 
Okay, Hella Crafts was born Hella Nielsen. Okay, this is even weirder. On mm. July 7th, 1947. <gasps> Today in is Denmark. July 7th. Today is July 7th. Oh, I just got chills. Isn't okay. that crazy pants? Yeah, that is. Ugh. Um, she would have been 76 years old today okay. if she had lived. Um, Hella became a flight attendant for Pan Am, which is presumably how she met her husband, Richard Crafts, who was a pilot for Eastern Airlines. And I wish I could tell you more about Hella, but that was, once again, almost the entirety of the information I was able to find out about her. Well, I'm going to guess based on those details that she was probably stunning because I'm pretty sure back in those days that was a prerequisite to be a Pan Am flight attendant. Well, right. She was uh, very pretty. She um, she was uh, naturally, like, I think, kind of like a dirty blonde, but she uh, bleached her hair blonde, and she was mm. she was quite lovely. Yes, she was quite lovely. Okay. Um, Richard was also a part-time policeman for reasons totally unknown, because his pilot salary at that time was 120 k a year, which is a lot of money when this story, uh, when this, when these events happened, it was 1986. He was making 120 K a year in 1986. I looked it up. That is equivalent to making 325,000 a year today. Holy shit. So why he was a part-time policeman, I don't know. Probably because he's a piece of shit who wants to lord power and authority over people and like carry a gun for a living. I don't fucking know. Cool. So uh, yeah, Richard and Hella got married in 1975 and they moved to the affluent community of Newtown, Connecticut, where they raised three children. Hella did continue to work as a flight attendant with the help of a live-in nanny named Marie Thomas. Okay. So it's the fall of 1986. Hella is 39. Um, she is starting to suspect that Richard, who is 10 years her senior, of cheating on her. And mm. she confronts him about it because she's found some, a, a lot of suspicious, like a lot of calls, like long distance phone calls to a number, like an unknown number that she doesn't recognize. Um, mm. Plus, he's rarely ever home and probably lying about where he is a lot of the time. And, you know, Richard's all pissed off. And he's kind of a douche. So Hella goes and meets with Diane Anderson, a divorce attorney, and expresses not only her concern that her husband is unfaithful, but also that she might actually be in danger from him. Oh, shit. She even had an idea that she knew who the woman was that her husband was sleeping with. So she and Diane decided Hella should hire a private eye to confirm her hunch. Hella enlisted Keith Mayo to do some digging, and Keith snagged some photos of Richard kissing another flight attendant outside of the woman's home in New Jersey. What a fucker. Other photos included them holding hands and the woman rubbing Richard's back and generally being extremely affectionate with each other. Mm -hmm. Keith described Richard as very cold, stating he had a very cold stare. And friends of Hella claimed that Richard and Hella did not have a close relationship and that Richard sometimes hit her. Oh, God, I hate this fucking guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's gross. So when Hella saw these photos, she broke down. She was sitting in a car with Keith when he gave her the photos that he uh, that he got of Richard and this woman, and she's sobbing, you know, like a good five, ten minutes just crying. So Hella's files for divorce. Um, she confides in some of her flight attendant friends, and she tells them, if anything ever happens to me, don't think it was an accident. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mm -hmm. On November 18th, 1986, Hella returned from a flight from Frankfurt, West Germany. This was before the wall came down and Germany was split into East and West. Mm -hmm. She got a ride home from a really good friend. And a few days later, Hella was a no-call, no-show for her next flight assignment. Oh, no. <sighs> Friends called the Kraft's house and Richard answered. He told them that Hella had gone to Denmark to visit her sick mother. Mm -hmm. And just didn't let her employer know. And just didn't let her employer know. That's right. But mm -hmm. later, he changed the story and said she'd gone on vacation with a friend. Like, like she would just go off on a vacation when she was scheduled to work and wouldn't call at all if she had to run off to be with her mom. It, <sighs> and it sounds yeah. like he was giving different people different stories. And then what happened was these people started talking to each other and put together that he wasn't keeping his story straight. Mm-hmm. Rookie mistake. 
Mm -hmm. Her friends contacted Diane, the divorce attorney, and they told her that Hella had disappeared. They also said there's no way Hella would do that on purpose, especially not to her three young children. Mm -hmm. Diane called Keith, private eye, and he said, we need to go straight to the Newtown police and we need to report her as missing. And they did so on December 1st. Oh, but does he work for the Newtown police? I don't know the part. Oh, does Richard like part time? Yeah. I don't, uh-huh. I don't, I mean, I think it must be Newtown police. I'm oh, not sure. Okay. Okay. I never really got which police department he worked for, but I would imagine he would, mm. right? Like the town yeah. he works in, he lives in. Yeah. Um, The Newtown police didn't seem to give a shit and they brushed Keith and Diane off. Mm, cool. Yeah. So Keith went into investigator mode because that's what he does. He interviewed Marie, the nanny, and she told of a dark, mysterious stain she found on the carpet shortly after Hella disappeared. It was just inside the couple's bedroom door about the size of a grapefruit and almost black in color. Oh. Not long after, the carpet in that bedroom was ripped up. And Richard offered no explanation to Marie as to why. Also of note, a large deep freezer in the garage was just gone. And credit card receipts showed that Richard had rented a commercial wood chipper right after Helen. <gasps> oh, God. No. With these suspicious things in hand, Keith went to the county prosecutor who referred the case to the Connecticut State Police. And state police brought Richard in to take a lie detector test. Good. So the polygraph examiner, otherwise known as a witch doctor quack, claims <laughs> that Richard showed very little reaction at all and that there was nothing that this quack or his quack partner saw that indicated that Richard was lying. <laughs> okay. But uh, other credit card receipts showed that the deep freezer that had gone missing was purchased right around the time of Hella's disappearance, along with other things like bed sheets and a comforter. Oh, my God. Okay. So <laughs> okay. this is where we start to get, this is where we start to get science Yes. Mm-hmm. Enter forensic expert, Dr. Henry Lee, director okay. of the Connecticut State Police Forensics Lab and one of the most respected forensic experts. Sweet. Not a quack. <laughs> no, not a quack. <laughs> uh, he went with the police on a search of the Crafts house on December 26, while Richard was vacationing with his children in Florida. Ooh. On the mattress of the bed that Hella and Richard shared, Dr. Lee found five tiny stains so small they could barely be seen. An orthotolidine solution on the mattress fibers turned blue, indicating that those stains were blood. Mm -hmm. A species test proved it was human blood. And the antigen test... Sorry, did you just throw out the science name for luminol? Is that what that is? I think so. No, is okay, Luminol was, like a is Luminol like a brand name? I don't know, but it's blue think, and it, it lights up if it's blood, right? No, that's different. That's when you're okay. searching visually. This is how you test. Oh God, I I'm think this is this actually turns. It, yeah, Orthotolidine, I think is different than okay. Luminol. Fascinating. Okay, sorry. So, like yeah. in the episode of uh, Forensic Files, they showed like the little piece of fabric from the mattress in a little tiny, tiny cup of a dish with like in a solution and the solution turned blue. Oh, wow. That's so fucking right. cool. Okay. Right. So species test proved it was human. The antigen test confirmed it was type O blood, which was the same type as Hella. They even had a method for determining that it was in fact circulation blood, not menstrual blood. Holy shit. Right. This is 1986. Wow. Dr. Lee studied the angle and, t- and intensity of the blood's impact. He deduced the blood hit the mattress at an angle of 10 degrees, meaning it came from someone who was leaning over the bed or kneeling and moving through the air at medium velocity consistent with an injury caused by a blunt object. Okay, I do want to pause here and point out that this was 1986 and much of what we know about blood spatter analysis in the last three decades has changed a lot. Correct. So grain of salt here on this particular piece. But there was also a six inch blood smear on the side of the mattress. Wow. So he I'm ripped still... up the carpet, but he didn't bother getting a new mattress? Gross. First off, this guy's a fucking idiot. I'm still right? fascinated that you can tell the difference between menstrual blood Circulation and... blood and menstrual blood. Me yes. too. Uh, because amazing. when I was watching the show and they were saying like, 
there was blood on the mattress. I was like, but maybe it's from her period. That doesn't prove anything. And then they went right into that. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected, Forensic Files. Yeah, totally. So yes. sorry. <laughs> and although the bathroom towels had been washed recently, Dr. Lee tested them with an orthotolidine solution. And the amount of blood that appeared on the towels proved they had been soaked in blood. But there was no murder weapon to be found. No body discovered. Police were left having to look for some other clues as to what had happened to Hella. So now that they've like searched the house, I think it's in the news. This woman's missing. There's suspicions of foul play. A snowplow operator comes forward to say that the week of Hella's disappearance, after it had snowed, he had seen a wood chipper on the side of the road near a bridge at about 3.30 in the morning. And he also briefly saw a man wearing an orange poncho. He said he saw the same wood chipper again about an hour later on River Road. So I think on another, on, at another spot while he was out in the middle of the night, like plowing the roads. He's just fucking wood chipping in a poncho on a bridge. Mm hmm. Oh. So man. sort of. Police had the snowplow driver take them to where he saw the wood chipper, and it was where the Housatonic River runs into Lake Zoar. Police thoroughly searched the riverbank, but all they found were a few mounds of wood chips. But as they looked closer, they realized they had found a piece of an envelope, and it was addressed to Ms. Hella L. Crafts. Whoa. One of the detectives even said later that he wasn't even thinking about what the wood chipper had to do with anything until they started to find hair. Oh, God. A lot of hair. Mm -mm. Blonde hair. Over many days, the police sifted through the dirt and debris along the riverbank. They found a few blue fibers, a gray piece of metal, possible tiny bone fragments, and then the sun had started to melt the snow and next to a wall, right on top of the leaves, a painted fingernail. No. Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, yes. All of this stuff is taken to Dr. Lee, who assembles a team of experts to help him. While the police were certain that Hella was dead and Richard was the one who murdered her and the news of his suspected guilt was making headlines across the country, he maintained his innocence. It was up to Dr. Lee and his team to find enough evidence to build a case strong enough to arrest and try Richard and convince a jury of his guilt. Oh, I forgot to tell you, they also sent divers to search the bottom of the river and they found pieces of a chainsaw with the serial <gasps> number scratched off. Oh, my God. So the first thing the forensic team did was go over that chainsaw with a fine-tooth comb. They found human hair, tissue, and a piece of fiber. A fiber so small, it was barely visible to the naked eye on the cutting edge of the chain. It was a bluish-green cotton, the same color as Hella's favorite cotton nightshirt. It also matched other bluish fibers found at the river. Then they applied a chemical solution to the scratched out serial number that revealed the number underneath the attempt to erase it, 5921616, the same number on the warranty card sent into the company by Richard Crafts. Oh, shit. Mm hmm. I like Dr. Lee. I know, right? We, we <laughs> like Dr. Lee a lot. There were 2,660 hairs collected at the river, and every single one of them were examined under a microscope. A lot of them had been cut, but not with scissors. <gasps> they used hairs from Hella's hairbrush to compare to the hairs found on the riverbank. So some of her forehead hairs had an unusual ridging in them that was also found on the hairs collected from the riverbank. They determined the hairs were extremely similar to Hella's. Wow. Next, wow. the fingernail, specifically the bright red nail polish on the fingernail. They compared the organic compounds in that polish with a bottle of red nail polish belonging to Hella found on her nightstand, and they were exactly the same polish. Holy shit. I didn't even know you can do that. There's mm -hmm. different compounds and different brands of of course, yes. Oh my shit, my mind is blown But still, right now. exactly, I know. But still, none of this evidence proved that Hella was dead. That That's gray true. piece of metal was believed by Dr. Lee to be the crown of a tooth, but it had no human remains attached to it. So Dr. Lee asks one of the detectives to go back to the river and search, 
And this guy did. He searched for five days. And on that fifth day, after eight hours of searching, this motherfucker found a tooth. This guy found a tooth in a river? Well, a river bank. That's literally a river. fucking needle in a haystack. Right? God damn. This and is they a were thing. able to match it to years of Hella's dental records. And they were positive this tooth came from Hella's mouth. Oh, my God. Now they can arrest Richard Crafts and charge him with the murder of his wife, Hella. Mm, good. Police and prosecutors could only piece together a reasonable guess at what exactly happened to Hella. We know she returned home from her flight from Germany around 7 p.m. and put the children to bed around 8. Marie had the night off and wasn't expected home until midnight. Hella likely changed into her favorite night shirt, maybe looked through her mail. They think she... She put it in her pocket. This is a weird assumption, but like how else did her piece of mail end up there too? It's very strange. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe she had started changing the sheets because clearly the blood got on the mattress. So there was no sheet between her and the mattress. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had would have had to have been removed in order for the blood smear to be there. For some reason, I cannot seem to figure out. They think Richard used a giant mag light as the murder weapon, bludgeoning her to death at the foot of the bed. Oh. Maybe, probably, wrapped her in the bed sheets or the comforter. He almost definitely put her in the deep freezer in the garage. He clearly tried to clean up the blood with those towels that later were washed, but still left behind the evidence of having been soaked in blood. Marie arrived home around 2 a.m. and went straight to bed. <sighs> That's chilling for her to realize later what was happening. And she's just... While she was out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God. Okay. Very early the next morning, Richard took Marie and the kids to his sister's house and told them Hella had left already. Mm. After dropping them all off, he rented the largest wood chipper he could find and a U-Haul to tow it with. And by that night, Hella's body would have been completely frozen. Richard loaded Hella's body, a chainsaw, and a bunch of wood into the U-Haul and headed to the river. As we know, that snowplow driver spotted the wood chipper twice in the wee hours of the morning. Richard used the chainsaw to hack up Hella's body and then put the pieces through the wood chipper along with some wood. God. And because the body was frozen, there was basically no blood splatter and most of the debris was blown into the river. Holy shit. For whatever reason, the mail addressed to Hella passed through the chipper virtually untouched. I wonder if it was like too thin or something. It didn't Maybe. Crap. Maybe. Wow. wow. And then Richard took apart the chainsaw, scratched away at the serial number, and threw it all into the river. Mm -hmm. so the biggest challenge, right. Uh, the biggest challenge in this case was, of course, the lack of a body. A prosecution for homicide requires an official determination of death of the alleged victim. But how do you do that when there's no body? In the case of Hella Crafts, the death certificate, the death certificate issued January 13th, 1987, was based on the identification of Hella's tooth. Mm -hmm. When investigators began looking for her remains, Richard supposedly uh, suggested to a relative that there wasn't anything left of his wife to find. According to the Hartford Cor Courant, Corrent, some paper in Hartford, Connecticut, he told mm. his brother-in-law, quote, let them dive. There's no body. It's gone. Holy shit. God. Mm -hmm. Awful. In, in preparation for trial and to bolster the state's case against Richard, Dr. Lee called in another expert to help him examine the little bits found on the riverbank that he was just certain were bones, and they decided to run a test. They rented the exact same wood chipper and ran a pig through it. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, the chipper made a signature cut on the pig bones that matched exactly with the debris found at the river. This bone expert examined these bone fragments from the river even further and found some of them had tiny grooves in them. These are the grooves of blood vessels inside the top of the skull, something only humans have. Wow. Holy shit. I know. God they were all, damn. I know, right? They mm -hmm. were also able to identify skull fragments from the side of the head. Forensically, these were the most important pieces of evidence. The angle of the beveling on the fragments meant there was tremendous force exerted on the skull. And while there's no way of knowing for sure if this was the force that killed her, we do know that either way, this was a dead human being. 
God, this fucking team is brilliant. I love right? this. Mm-hmm. Right? They mm-hmm. were also able to determine the bones came from someone with type O blood, the same type as Hella. Trial began in May 1988 in New London, where the trial had been moved after a change of venue request due to the extensive local publicity, which is about 80 miles and just under two hours away from Newtown. Now, I saw on the forensic files when they were talking about like uh, the it, making the national news, like literally yeah. a current of like they, they had a blip of a current affair on there. Mm-hmm. Like that's that. the level I know, remember a current affair. Uh, anyway, like. I, I was thinking about you and the way you're always like, really changing really? the venue to like mm-hmm. less than two hours away is going to make that big of a difference, right? Like fucking not. Okay. No. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, the trial lasted 54 days. Shit. Well, I mean, look at how much forensic evidence they had to yeah. go over. Yeah. Wow. The, the jury deliberated for 17 days. Wow. And on July 15th, 1988, a single juror the only juror in favor of acquittal refused to continue with deliberations and the judge declared a mistrial. Come on. Fuck. The following year, Richard Crafts was retried in Norwalk, which is actually closer to Newtown than New London. This trial resulted in a guilty verdict reached by the jury in only eight hours this time on November 21st, 1989. And Richard Crafts was sentenced to 50 years. Okay. This was the first time in Connecticut state history that a murder conviction was secured without a body. Wow. On January 30th, 2020, just in time for the pandemic, Mm -hmm. Richard was released early on good behavior, almost two decades early, (sighs) and went to live in a halfway house in Bridgeport, even though his sentence stipulated the earliest he could be released was August of 2021. He was like like 82 or something at this time. It looks like this is based on a grandfather situation, meaning that at the time of his sentencing, a law allowed for sentences to be reduced by years as a reward for good behavior and prison work. And that law has since changed. They struck that law down in like 1994. Mm -hmm. Richard Crafts maintains his innocence to this day. Okay. Okay. And of note... At the very end of the 1996 film, Fargo, Steve Buscemi's character is killed and his body is put through a wood chipper. The special edition DVD says that the film was inspired by Hella's murder. Wow. Holy shit. That's interesting. That, I was thinking of that the whole time. Uh, this is like Fargo. For good reason. Yep, exactly. Mm-hmm. That's, where, that's where Fargo got it. Oh and that God. is the disappearance and murder of Hella Crafts. Wow, sister. Fuck. You're basically Bill Nye. <laughs> Dude, I do love getting nerdy on some forensic files. Let me tell you. That ya. was incredible. Hats off right? to that forensic team. Right? That was Every like 1986. Mm-hmm. There wasn't even DNA. They couldn't even use DNA to like confirm shit. They were just doing this in every other way they could. That's incredible. The blood vessels in the skull, I think, was right? the thing that just... Blew your mind, literally. Blew my like my fucking mind. And the guy that found the tooth at a riverbank. No. Jesus Christ. Anyway, so if you ever want to go back and do a comforting rewatch, Chaos Kids, go back and watch some forensic files and start with season one, episode one, inaugural episode, the murder God. of, or actually it's called The Disappearance of Hella Crafts. Mm, wow. That was amazing, sister. Wow, wow, wow. Well, uh. I don't know how to pivot from that other than... Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What? Oh, that's right. And scene. Chaos. There it is. That <laughs> Chaos. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I'm going to tell you a little... We're back to bears. Bears? Start there. mm-hmm. We haven't done bears in a really long time. Is there a donut we, lady? There's not a donut lady and there's no Nazis, but... <laughs> Charlie Sheen. Um, Does Charlie Sheen come along for the ride? <laughs> no, I can try and figure out how to weave him in. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Um, have you ever heard of the grizzly man? Oh, is this the guy that like lived with the bears? Yeah. I mean, I've heard of it. I mean, I've heard of it. I don't, I don't, I don't know the details. Oh, I I got him though. Right. They got him. I do know that. (laughs) Just, it doesn't end well for the grizzly man. No. Well, I'm going to tell you about him. His name is Timothy. Okay. 
Um, he grew up as Timothy Dexter in Long Island in a middle class family with four siblings. His parents are still married. His mom said that Timothy was a really good kid and a good student. And him and his mom were always both really connected to animals. He excelled on his high school swim team and got a scholarship for swimming, but he injured his back in his first year and lost his scholarship and ended up moving back home with his parents. Oh, bummer. That's like, mm -hmm. a, oh, man. The, mm -hmm. mm, I, I yeah. know what that can do to people. I yeah, like personally, I, yep. Yeah. Yep. So at 19, he moves out to California and he changes his last name to Treadwell. So he Tread wants Treadwell. Treadwell. He Timothy went to California Treadwell. with an Aiken in his heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was on the love connection. No. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that, uh, is that like one of those old timey dating games? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't mm -hmm. remember the love connection? I remember the dating game, but I don't, and I remember, I know the love connection and I know it's a dating game, but I can't remember the difference between how the love connection worked versus the dating, the dating game. Cause I, they, one of them, like they would have the three bachelors or bachelorettes, like, and you couldn't see them. And then the person would like the one would ask questions and, mm -hmm. and then pick one or whatever. So it was similar to that. Yeah. So cringy. Okay. So fucking cringy. So cringy. But you know what's mm -hmm. funny about those games too is that I didn't realize until much, much later that like that like those are a lot of times they're those are just spring those are like hopeful springboards for like um modeling and and acting careers. Those oh. are the people that usually go on those shows. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. exactly what Timothy was doing. I just want to be on uh -huh. TV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, according to him, he auditioned for Woody Harrelson's part on Cheers. Oh, I know. Mm. And when he didn't get it, he was devastated and he started to spiral. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. He had a near fatal overdose. Um, and that is when he decided to reinvent himself. So he adopted an Australian accent and told people he was from a small village in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. I mean, he just decided he was Australian. <laughs> I mean, this is like steps towards con man status, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. The thing that was just sort of uh, loosely touched on, which I felt like deserved a deeper dive, was likely the significant mental health issues that are going on with this man. Uh, yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. No, no one in that's stable and well decides to adopt a foreign accent and tell people they're from a place they're not from. No. Mm -mm. That's no. okay. <sighs> All right. So he was already like, really in love with animals, but he became fascinated by wildlife in general, specifically grizzly bears. So he started a career traveling to elementary schools and educating kids about bears. He's he did, very much like the crocodile guy. The what crocodile hunter or whatever his name is. Yeah. 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 Well, oh, and I'm um, presumably this whole time he's still pretending to be Australian. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but even in some and of wait, the clips, Okay, so he just like appointed himself like an educator on grizzly bears. Yeah, but also had, okay, so he had no he, experience or credentials, or he just like what read the grizzly bear section of the encyclopedia and decided he was an expert now. Apparently, and also what's odd is that he's in California, he's very close to the Pacific Northwest, which is literally the, the home of grizzly bears. But <laughs> you're going to lie and say that you're from Australia and then come I'm, back with, I'm a grizzly bear expert, not a fucking right. koala bear. Right. Yeah. Or, or an emu, for example. <laughs> or a kangaroo. <laughs> no. 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 Grizzly bears. Grizzly bears. Yep. The mm -hmm. Australian who's an expert in grizzly bears. Perfect. Yep. 
Yep. Grew up there, learned about grizzlies my whole ass life. So okay. the kids love him and he kind of becomes a celebrity of sorts. He's even interviewed by Keith Morrison, uh huh, who we love. Keith Morrison asks him, like, do you have a death wish and why in the world would you put yourself in danger? And he even says, you can't tell me that you're if, it, if you're in the middle of being attacked by a bear, you aren't going to be thinking, I made a mistake and I wish I was armed right now. And Timothy says, I would never kill a bear. I would never go into their home and kill them. So at, at this time that he's touring elementary schools as a grizzly bear expert from Australia, he is also claiming to have spent time with grizzly bears? Yeah, so... Yep. So here we go. So <laughs> for, for 13 straight seasons, Timothy lives on the Alaskan Peninsula, completely alone in the wilderness, filming himself. The season is from July to September before they hibernate. And he believes that he is needed there every year to protect the grizzlies. I'm sorry, from... Well, literally, you're not allowed to be there as a human at all. Like there's no... I. No, I don't. He thinks that there's poachers, and we get into that too because there's okay. a right. Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> is so serious. So here's one of his quotes: "I love them. I will protect them, but I will not die at their claws and paws. I am a kind warrior. Give it to me, baby. That's what I'm talking about." <laughs> what? Okay. So this is also okay. Is it? Is this on film? Does he do this yeah, on camera? He films, him, he films himself every season. And the thing is, is that he's there July to September, sometimes a little longer, and he's filming himself. So I think part of it, not part of it, all of it is mental health issues. And then also some sort of weird, I don't know what you call it, cabin fever, but by yourself and you're fucking losing it and filming it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's one point where he's watching a grizzly who scratches, um, himself on a tree, like scratching his back. And he, yep. I kid you not, sounds just like John Candy in the great outdoors. He goes, Oh, big bear. That's a big bear. Big bear. <laughs> okay. 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 So also he has named a lot of these animals. So one of the bears that he named the Grinch starts snapping at him. And Timothy very calmly says, don't do that. I love you. Don't do that. Oh, but he's just cool as a cucumber. Oh. The, he's mm -hmm. like missing uh, like that switch that humans are supposed to have that like help us survive that makes us cautious and fearful of predators that can kill us. Yeah, he does like a little when he's doing the don't do that. I love you like a little nose bop like you would expect someone to do to their cat or like. Five he's, pound dog. he's booping noses of grizzly bears? <laughs> yeah. He's like, stop it, Mr. Grinch. Stop it. Don't do that. I love you. Be nice. Oh, my God. This mm -hmm. guy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's also footage where Timothy is witnessing a fight between two bears, Sergeant Brown and Mickey. Um, Mickey. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. So Mickey was the loser of this fight. He's not dead, but he's almost dead. And he's resting on the beach from exhaustion. And Timothy like sits next to him and like gives him a pep talk about losing the fight, but he's really proud of him and he did a good job. Wrong road, Timothy. Like not now. I, Mickey, I, Mickey needs to rest. This, and then, you know, this anthropom, an anthropom, anthrop, anthropom, anthrop, I can't find the word. It's when you, anthropomorphication i can't remember the word but it's when you when you humanize non-human oh. animals right oh yeah when you yeah, ascribe yeah, yeah. human personality and and, and characteristics to non-human animals which is its own its own kind of problematic it, yeah okay okay mm -hmm. timothy um he also is friends with a family of foxes um his bestie is I iris stop and, it yeah in one of the clips iris is sleeping next to him and he's like giving a confessional to iris uh, explaining his history of alcoholism and how the animals saved him to the fox to the to iris 
I'm sorry, not the fox, to Iris, who is a fox. Yeah, yeah. uh-huh. He, there's, there's some more foot. There's so much footage. I mean, you've, he finds a dead bee on a flower and he goes on about how tragic it was that the bee died doing his job. And he ends this weird footage with, I love that bee. Um, then he finds bear poop and he gets real excited because it's Wendy's poop. And he, he knows this. Um, Wendy is a bear. How does um, he know it's Wendy's poop? He knows what Wendy's poop looks like. <laughs> uh-huh. It's okay. seriously right out of the scene of like Jurassic Park. But like, he just goes in with his hand. He's touching it. He says it's really special and it's still warm, which means that Wendy was just here. Oh, my God. Yeah. So on his season that was the year 2000, bears are killing their young and eating them because of the lack of rain and the lack of salmon running through the river. And there's footage of Timothy screaming at the sky that it needs to rain because Sergeant Brown needs rain. And he's like, I want rain. We need rain. Come on, Christ man or Hindu flowing thing. What? So a few days later, he's filming and it's raining. And he says that he is the Lord's servant and it's a miracle. Okay. He also has a teddy bear that he takes with him everywhere that he's had since a kid named Tabitha. And so he's like throwing Tabitha up in the air and like, Tabitha, the rain came. We did it. Like he really believes that if he hadn't been there, the rain wouldn't have come and the bears would have died. Oh, Timothy, this Mm -hmm. is this isn't even funny. This is, this is, yeah, this is some really horrible mental health problems. Yes. So at the end of uh, the season of the year 2000, Timothy does a signing off on film and completely loses it. He's talking about civilization and the government and the parks people. And he's just like on camera, like, fuck you, fuck you government and fuck you poachers i mean mm -hmm. yeah do they really have a poaching problem of grizzly bears in alaska not according to the one of the natives that is interviewed for this documentary about they have like really strict things in place to actually prevent that like this is an area where it's supposed to be no humans at all like it's the grizzlies natural habitat there is none of that um and he gets in, he makes some good points because he is, I think, a, a real expert on the grizzlies and their needs and this area of the world and what needs to happen and all the things. So Timothy insists on always being in the wilderness completely alone. However, he did have a few different girls with him up there at different times, but he kept them entirely off camera and pretended to be alone. Okay. Uh huh. On his very last season, Amy was traveling with him, uh, who was his girlfriend at the time. And there's only two shots of Amy on camera, but in both shots, her face is totally shield. Oh. Shielded. Shielded. Right. I, yeah. So I don't know if that was her wishes or his. I mean, it's obvious that he's not alone, but very weird. So Okay. Even though there are plenty of statistics showing that poaching is no longer a threat in that area, Timothy is convinced that the poachers come in September, um, which is when he heads back because they're supposed to be going into hibernation. So when it gets to that time of year, he gets in full camo gear, he has a green painted face, and he goes into full bear protection mode. What does that mean? Um, That he's like crawling through the wilderness on his elbows there's people in in one scene there's people pulling like people know that he's there because he's kind of famous and he does this every year and films it or more like infamous yeah and so people will pull up on a boat um at the river and i i think they're trying to get a glimpse of him right (laughs) who's literally and like his like living is like a very is like a green tent which looks more like a tarp like deep in the woods like he's very hidden but he's convinced that, you know, there's there's humans nearby and there's not supposed to be humans nearby. And so they must be poachers. And he, he just goes into full fucking G.I. Joe down at the riverbank, like ready to throw down. But he doesn't have a, any weapons. No, there's no nothing. Mm-mm. Oh, okay. 
Uh, some I'm, I'm sources, trying to, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm trying to figure out if he were to actually encounter poachers who would presumably have firearms strong enough and powerful enough to take down a grizzly bear. Mm -hmm. What exactly he is going to do about them if he is unarmed? I have no idea. And neither um, does he. And neither does he. Nope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. His goal is to get the bears to safety. Uh, yep. Um, so Timothy believed that he could bond with the grizzly bears and be one with the universe with them. And obviously he lost sight of the fact that they're extremely dangerous um, and, yeah. Uh-huh. And his intentions raised a lot of controversy. So the Alaskan natives believe that Timothy invaded into their territory and disrespected the bears and that he crossed a boundary that they have lived by for several thousands of years. And that, um, while he believed that he was protecting the bears, he was actually putting them in danger by teaching them that humans are safe. Mm -hmm. They already have an instinct to run away and he is harming that instinct, right? Right. So on his 13th season in October, his pilot returns to the peninsula in Alaska to pick him up for the end of the season. So he gets dropped off uh, by a pilot every year on the river with like barrels of food and all the things, right? And just all his gear. And then the pilot takes off, like just leaves him there, right? And comes back oh. in October to get him. Okay. So he goes to pick him up. It's the end of the season. Uh, this is the season where he's with his partner, Amy, and they're not at the pickup spot. So he flies the plane over the dense forest a few times. And that is when he sees a bear eating what is clearly a human rib cage. Oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So he returns to civilization and lets people know what's happening. And a crew goes out to recover the bodies. They are able to find his head and an arm with his watch still attached. Ugh. They uh, they find the bear that ate Timothy and Amy, and the bear is killed, and inside the bear was human clothing and remains. They killed the bear? Mm hmm Do we know why? I'm not sure. Is this like a, now it has a taste for humans, it's dangerous to us now situation? I don't know if their intention really was to retrieve the remains of Timothy and Amy. I, I okay. don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when Amy and Timothy were attacked, the cameras were rolling. Okay. Okay. No, no, no. The lens cap was on and it's only audio and the audio has never been released. Okay. Um, Timothy's friend, who also seemed to sort of be his next of kin, has the one and only copy. And at the end of this documentary, she destroys it. But um, but she allows the documentary filmmaker to listen to it first. And Timothy is attacked first. And you can just hear him moaning and yelling for yelling to Amy to run away. But she doesn't. She stays with Timothy. The attack on Timothy lasted six minutes. And then after that, Amy was killed. Oh, my God. There were journals found of Amy's, too, that she did not want to be there. She was terrified of the bears. Like, she, I don't think she really knew what she was getting into entirely. When she agreed to be dropped off months for months and months in the, the Alaskan wilderness with this guy who she didn't realize was not well? Correct. Got it. Yeah. So at the end of this documentary, uh, some of his friends spread his ashes at his campsite um, and mixed in with his ash ashes are um, some of Iris the fox's hair um, and bear hair from his bear friends. Where where did they get that? Oh, uh, at some point um, in one of the seasons, Iris passed away and Timothy buried her and saved some of her hair. I think so. Yep. And that's the story of the grizzly man. <sighs> Here's the problem is... Most of the people there's in the just one. Well, okay. Well, no. Um, <laughs> the people in this documentary are very. He knew that they were his close friends that he knew through his wildlife lifestyle, 
And they were all like, he died doing what he loved. And they no, but there was nobody in his inner circle that was like, dude, uh, I think no. They were all like, so beautiful, the work he's doing. And what the work he's doing? Mm hmm. He the one lady that spread his ashes, she lives just on the cusp of the Alaskan Peninsula. And that's where that was like his, you know, he would go there and then be flown out, you know, like. Right. That was, that his, was like his 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 mm -hmm. his stopping point along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And the other gal who was his next of kin and also like his ex-girlfriend started whatever company this was that allowed him to go to the schools and do all the things. And so. It just seemed like there wasn't anybody in his circle that was like, dude, this is not not a good idea. Was he faking the Australian accent in all the video footage he took by himself, too? No. <laughs> no. What the fuck? Uh, I mean, you've got to see this. It's like, I, the thing is, too, is that he really... I believe that he really loves animals and cares. And I he really believed that he was doing good work. But, but this no one okay. but like he wasn't doing anything. He was just uh, hanging out with the bears. So like what he thought uh, that he had to be posted up there during their season when they were vulnerable. Okay, at were the all river of these through. inner circle friends that were like, he was doing what he loves. Um, were they all white people? Mm hmm. Yep. Mm hmm. Yep. So like yep. the one voice of dissent and reason was the Native American who actually lives there and isn't in his inner circle. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. OK. OK. Yeah. And you know what? The parks and the the parks and rec or the the whatever the mm -hmm. national Forest. The forestry people, yeah. Yes, they actually are amazing stewards of of the animals and the wilderness. And you know, they do. Um, they have cameras set up up there now. And they have you ever heard of Fat Bear Week? Yeah, 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 yeah. I and love I, Fat Bear Week. It's the best. And they like track them, and they have like you know votes to see who we think is the winner of like who's the fattest bear, right before they go into hibernation. Like that's what I was thinking about when. Right. And they don't go in there to get that camera footage. They have like wildlife cams set up. That's not what was happening here. Uh, did anyone, did the documentary people, did they talk to anyone in his family, like his mom or anything? His parents were interviewed. Yeah. Um, did they also say he died doing what he loved or were they? They didn't really speak too much about his death. I think they were the ones that kind of, very briefly touched on him having a hard time finding his way and sort of struggling with addiction and finding a path and mental health issues. Well, uh, bears. We bears. Did we did it again with the bears. Nope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we sure did. There's always chaos when bears get in the mix. You know what I'm saying? Always. Yep. So like, let that be a warning to all of us chaos kids that, uh, no, no, no good comes with interacting with bears. That oh, don't do it. Let's not, let's not feed them donuts. Mm -hmm. Let's not go live in their habitat and boop them on the nose. No matter how adorable <laughs> their noses are, how much you want to, they're not our friends. Bears are not our friends. They're oh not. <laughs> they're not. Oh my God. Oh my God. Why do people need <sighs> to be told this? I don't understand. Well, there was that guy that like lived with the wolves, right? Mm -hmm. There was like a dramatized version of his story made into film. He, I'm almost positive he also was eventually killed by the wolves that he tried to live Probably. with. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Like, yeah. stop it, you guys. Fucking stop. Mm hmm. Don't fucking do it. This is I mean, a jungle book. It's not going to work that way. No, you are not Mowgli. <laughs> No, you're not. <laughs> Trust in me. <laughs> oh, shit, sister. You're not going to find your Baloo, okay? <laughs> no, uh-uh. Baloo will eat your face. You know, I mean, That's here's the thing, happen. right? Like, even bears that are raised from cubs in captivity and, like, made to perform and spend time around people, like, even those bears have 
been known to maul and kill their keepers and pe- other humans around them. Like, just like, yeah. just like Siegfried and Roy, right? With the tigers. Like, you can't, you can't take well, okay. wild animals like that. No. And you can't hang out with them in their habitat and expect that they're not going to get. This is, I mean, okay. Except for what's her name? Jane, Jane Goodall and the gorillas, right? Was it Jane Goodall or was it her that lived with the gorillas? Yeah, but. Or was it the other lady? Anyway, but even then, yeah. like, she was, she knew she was at risk. She didn't just yes. like walk into the middle of like a pack of gorillas and sit down and like boop them on the nose. Like she, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Try to give them pep talks like they were humans. She actually spent all this time, like sitting near them quietly and like mimicking them and trying to convince them that she was a gorilla. She did not treat them like humans and see them as humans. She became a gorilla in order to do that. Anyway, sorry, you were going to say something and I totally interrupted you. Oh, I don't even remember now. God, God. (laughs) don't don't play with bears. Don't play with bears. Don't, just don't play with bears. Mm -mm. Wow, sister, thanks for that. (sighs) That was horrible. That was was hilarious and then sad and then literally horrible. Horrific. So uh, great yeah. chaos story. Thank you Thank so you, much. Sister. Do you have anything You're for welcome. the good of the order? Just check us out on all the things. All um, the things. Oh, we're on all the socials. We're on all the socials, including the TikTok. The TikTok. <laughs> we made it to the TikTok. Oh my God. I can't believe oh, it. Oh <laughs> man. There we are. There we're we are on the TikTok. On the TikTok. <laughs> Go check that out. Unbelievable. Shit. We'll see uh, how this goes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, uh, you can check out my band at tinfoiltophat.com. You can check out Naomi's personal misnomers on Twitter. That's right. Just, that's right. Yeah. What else? Um, send us, uh, send us mail, send us emails, uh, crime, wine and chaos at gmail.com. We will, we'd love to hear from you or, uh, you know what? Go rate us, go rate us on your, on your podcast app and, uh, give us, give us some stars and give us a review if you, if your app allows for it. So other people can get in on the chaos because yeah, they can. it's always fucking chaotic around chaotic. here. Day yeah. was totally chaotic. Chaotic. Yes. <laughs> But what you said is correct. (laughs) Goodbye. Bye. 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 Crime, Wine, and Chaos is produced by 8th Direction Records. Artwork by Joshua M. Davis. Music by Paul Abner. If you would like to support the show, you can visit our Patreon page at Crime, Wine, and Chaos forward slash Patreon. Cheers. We're back to bears. Quack, quack, quack. God, I'm already failing the science segment.